Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about doing faux wood grain. Uh, so oftentimes with models you get uh, you get elements of the model. Usually this comes up with things like hafts uh, of weapons or bows that seem like they should be wood, like made of wood, but they're smooth. So, you know, because of limitations of modeling and scale detail, we can't really capture uh, very tiny cracks and inconsistencies that wood would have. So what we have is a flat surface, something like this. This is just a tiny little scrap of plastic card. It is, as you can see, completely flat and featureless. And I've just painted it gray um, to sort of represent a mid-tone primer that might be on something. And so the question becomes, how do we take something like this and turn it into wood when we want it to look realistic? Uh, and the reality is it's actually a very simple little trick you can do. So we're going to kind of go through that. And our tools today are going to be as follows. So the main thing you're going to use is a black... Uh, I prefer something like a black ink. You want something soft. and black, you don't want something overpowering. Um, so I'm going to use this black ink. You could use Nuln Oil. You could use a watered-down black paint. Anything would work. And then I'm going to use some scale color white sands, a white I particularly love. But it's basically just a, an ivory warm white, something like that. Any warm white will do you. Um, at the same time, we're also going to use some Seraphim Sepia and some Scale 75 Intense Wood. Uh, now, I usually talk about replacements you can use. I will say this is as close to ir irreplaceable as you can get. Uh, if you're not familiar with Intense Wood, it's out of the Ink Tensity set of Scale 75 inks. I have a product review on my channel. This is probably one of the best uh, inks I've ever used. This is Sorcery in a Bottle. Uh, I cannot recommend this particular product enough, and you'll see why as we move through the, the video. Uh, I've also got some Ethonian Camo Shade here, which is a sort of green shade, uh, and we'll move through. The only other thing we need is a pretty sharp brush. So, uh, our trick here is going to be very simple. We're going to create our wood grain as undershading. And so I've talked about undershading in many videos before, but the idea is you're creating your sort of color pattern before you're creating the actual color. So that is to say, I'm going to create the striations in the wood, even though it has nothing to do with brown. So to do that, I'm just going to take my little piece of plastic card here, and I'm just going to paint some nice thin lines. Now, I'm not going to run the whole length of the thing. One of the things I often see people do who attempt a sort of faux wood grain is they run the whole length of the thing. They like literally start at the top and go straight down. Wood isn't nat or it isn't uh, wood isn't regular like that. It has variations. Th you know, pieces of bark shift. They come and go. They lay over top of each other. It's a very random, organic pattern. As such, what I'm literally doing is just making hashes of various sizes here. Okay, no real concern with exactly where they land. In fact, the more sort of random they are, the better. So I'm just going to really get in there, make a bunch of different little hashes. Some run off. Some are like basically dots. Some are, are longer. Okay. So what we end up with is something like that. Easy peasy so far, right? Any, anybody can do this. We can all draw little thin straight lines. I just took my white sands, had it watered down so it was flowing, and then made some very light touch thin lines. Now I'm going to take my black ink. Now in this case, it's going to look really strong when I initially put it on here because black ink looks really strong when you initially put it on. But why, one of the reasons I like it is it actually softens when it dries. And I'm going to try to match some of the white uh, elements, but I'm going to match it in uh, an unusual or in a slightly different pattern. So I'm always going to go on the right side of the white lines, but I'm not going to trace it. I'm not doing like a battle damage scar, I, but I do want it to be somewhat close to create a sort of illusion of directionality. Sometimes I'll trace the whole line. Sometimes I'll run beyond the line. Sometimes I'll just do something completely on its own. And that's okay. 
the point is is that I want to create the illusion that there's some kind of sense to this. And so the darker places need to interact with the lighter places in some kind of sensible fashion. Something that, uh, that your eye, when it sees it, will understand roughly what's going on. And so again, we just make some little dots, cut some from the edge. Okay. Quick, easy, painless. There you go. Again, very simple. Okay. So now we get something like that. Very nice and easy. Now, again, that black looks rather strong. And that's okay. Uh, nothing, there's nothing bad about that. Sorry, we need to refocus on that at that distance. There we go. Okay, nothing that, nothing that tricky about what I've done so far. I've drawn little squiggly lines. In fact, if your hand tends to shake a little and you find drawing very straight lines difficult, hey, guess what? Here, that's an advantage because wood tends to squiggle a little. It, the bark is irregular, it's, it, it's unnatural. Now, if we were dealing with a weapon haft, it would obviously be, you know, Size-wise, it would probably be that, like what's on the top side of my brush there compare by comparison, right? So you would have less. Um, you can also uh, change these in direction. I, like, I tend to run the same direction as though this is a wood plank where most of the grain tends to run the same direction. But there's no reason why, if this were more organic natural wood, something hacked directly out of a tree instead of finished, I couldn't also have some slight directional changes. I couldn't have one that comes down and runs across. So in other words, I couldn't have one that goes like that. Okay. And kind of comes across the, the element. In fact, a little bit of directional change can help something look more organic. So again, I go into my white, I go into my black. Still follow the same sort of element. I can have maybe a black one that just crosses right here. Okay. So we create a little, you know, kind of chops angles. Again, nature is very random. That's why it's nature. It's not planned. It's not something fabricated. Now, once that's down, admittedly right now, it doesn't really look much like wood, right? I mean, when we look at that, we can, okay, I guess I see what's going on here, but I don't understand how this is wood. Well, that's where the magic happens. And the magic is the scale 75 ink intensity, intense wood. Aside from being the funniest name in paint, I don't know if that's a translation issue or what, um, but it's also one of the my favorite paints, period, in the world. Now, the intense wood, the key with it is, it, it's almost like a stain. Uh, if you've ever, were, if you've ever actually stained wood, you know that like it's a pretty magical effect when you put your stain onto a normal piece of wood, how it just brings out all the the natural wood grain. And you can suddenly, all these invisible striations that you couldn't see before suddenly explode. So I've just put some regular ink tense intense wood on my palette. And now what I'm going to do is just, we'll just do the top part here so I can grasp this easily. is just run it in nice, smooth layers up the wood, or up the plastic, as it were in this case, up the would-be faux wood. Now, depending on the nature of the gray underneath, you may have better or worse initial results. I tend to like to have, if you have a very light gray, this will look better on first shot. But notice how the wood looks cold. That's because I used a somewhat green gray. So the color of your undershading matters here, okay? So how, uh, exactly how intense uh, you want the color to be is gonna be largely a matter of what your undershading is. If you have more white, if you use sort of a white uh, undershading or a primer or whatever, then what you'll get is something that looks very warm. If you use a cold gray color like I did, you'll get wood that looks very cold. So now we have to let that dry, which takes a moment. 
But you can see how already, just like that, you have something that now looks like wood. And really, you can stop there. The trick is just that simple. Like, at the scale of a weapon haft or something easy like that, you're not really going to notice any... You're not really going to need to go much deeper. But if you want to take it farther, you can. I have to wait for this to dry. That's the problem with little pieces of plastic card. They don't tend to dry very quickly. Now... The one downside of scale 75 is that it is somewhat glossy, and you can see when I reflect across there how I get a little bit of gloss. That's where we can use things like Seraphim Sepia, Athonian Camo Shade, Agrax, anything like that. We can use our different GW shades in combination. You can use any of these. It doesn't matter. I happen to pick these. You can use any ones you want. Um, again, you could use Sepia inks from Vallejo or anything like that. But... You can even put on additional, uh, you know, additional layers of the intense wood, and that'll be fine. You can see that's drying up there. Um, the goal here is to make sure that you want this wood shade to be completely dry, so I can't, I can't leave it on while I've still got that stuff wet. Um... But you can see how now that everything is drying and coming together, you get this wonderful wood finish. And all that undershading of white got tinted. All the black remains more or less black. And that's one of the advantages. If we wanted to go again, we can. I'll do a couple different examples here. Here's where we can get a little wacky. We can get out our Seraphim Sepia. So first off, I could do another layer of my intense wood. Wouldn't be a problem. So let's say down here, I can apply a second layer. Again, keep it thin and under control. And what I'll get is a darker shade. Every one of these is basically a stain. It acts a lot like a wood stain. Where it's not going to, it's just going to intensify the color the more you put on. So you can see the color differential, not just because it's wet, between the lower part and the upper part. After two applications, we're starting to get a much richer wood color. At the same time, I could also take some of my, uh, some of my Seraphim Sepia, and if I want to tint the color, I could run that Seraphim Sepia up there. Again, I'm not slopping it on, but I'm not being too careful either. All right? And this tints it a slightly different way. I could also take the Athonian Camo Shade. I could mix that in. I could take the Agrax. Let's, uh, let's get some Agrax open here. Much darker black-brown. And I can apply shadows to the whole thing. You'll see how that makes it just look much darker. Okay? Now... I'm going to let this all really set and dry, and then we'll come back and we'll just talk about some other ways you can spice this up. Okay? So back in just a moment. All right, and we're back. And so everything's dry, but you can see how the scale 75 still has a bit of a sheen to it. Right? Like when I reflect in the light, you get that sheen on that side. Now, wood is obviously very dull, and that's one of the reasons I like finishing with the GW shade, because you can see how that is just nothing. Nothing coming off there. You can see how we've got something that now looks pretty much like wood. Uh, like, that's a nice sort of natural wood grain. we got some heavy grain to it. Uh, the I'll say the stronger the black you use, the stronger the grain is going to appear. If you back some of that out, thin it down, water it down, <clears throat> you know, make your lines uh, less sort of obtrusive and obvious, you will have a lighter touch to your grain. Now, there's still more we can do, of course. As I said before, this is probably fine, but we can go farther, as per always. Uh, so we can go back and we can continue undershading. Now, wood also tends to have some interesting variation in it. So one of the things we can do is we can go back to our white sand. And we can do two things with that new white, with that white sand. The first thing we can do is we can make some more lines that we'll then cover later. So we can kind of cross over some items. We can make some new 
lines. We're purposely going to cross some of our older dark lines. Okay. We're still going to try to hue to the, the same paradigm we set up before where we've got left and right and those sorts of things with our light and dark. So we still want to kind of heed that. We can reinforce some of our former lines, draw them out, make them bigger. The other thing we can do, so we can see how we've got some of those back on there. And the point is, is that what we're going to do next, spoiler alert, what we're going to do next is cover it over with the ink and the shade again. And the reason we do multiple layers is because wood, again, being in nature, tends to be very built up over time, right? And so there's lots of different organic material, dirt, dust, natural growth, life that has gotten on there. The other thing we can do is we can get someone on a brush we don't mind being as accurate with, so we don't want to use our nice sharp tip brush. And we can just kind of kind of stipple. And we can create little spots of sort of stippled white paint. Okay? So we get stuff like that. Now, what we're then going to do, let's go back to our, uh, let's open up, sorry, there we go, wrong one. Let's open up our camo shade. And what we're going to do, by the way, you can also, if you don't want to use this camo shade, if you want it to be really more intense, you could also use a dark green, uh, which will really kick what I'm about to do up. But I can start running that camo shade over these white areas that I just set down to sort of give them a green tint. I'm not being careful about it. I'm just kind of making sure that they're covered. Okay? Now, if you want it to be, and that will sort of tint them green. If you want it to be a really strong effect, if you want something that really, really stands out, like you want this to look like sort of old moss, then you can grab something like my camo light green here, which you'll notice has this very sort of rich green color. So it depends on how strong you want the effect. We can thin that out a little bit. And we can actually then run that specifically over the top. Again, just kind of working it in, not being too careful, almost stippling it on top of it. Now what you get is a little more strong green tint. It's still minor. The trick with this wood is that we're not pushing around anything super strong. Like we don't want something bright shock green on here, right? When you walk outside, it's unless you're in like a forest that's completely covered in moss. It doesn't tend to look that strong. And then what we're going to do, by the way, you can split up these steps if you want it to look more clean. You can do the intense wood first, then do then come back, do more white dots, do the do another layer of the green, and so on and so forth. In other words, you can mix through these steps, put on some undershade, put on your shade color, you know, your wood, your sepia. Put on some undershade of some white and black. And you see what I'm saying? Like, you can just keep repeating these layers. So now what I'm going to do is just... I'll kind of avoid the areas that have green as much as I can. If a little bit gets over the top, guess what? That's a good thing. Again, we're not trying to be perfect here because we want this to have a randomness to it. We want some of the colors to be up in each other's business. Okay. And now you can see, you can see that tonal variation in the wood. You can see where the different colors are starting to reflect there and shine through. Okay. And when we want to finish it out, once that scale 75 dries, we generally want to have one color, sort of one final, very thin filter color that's going to tie everything together. So your sort of last step, however many of these you decide to do, your last step should be to apply a filter. Now, the way we do that is, in this case, we're going to go ahead and use sepia. But the concept behind a filter color is, is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. We take something like a shade or an ink or even thinned paint. I tend to prefer using inks or shades for this as it's much easier. 
we're gonna get them we're gonna get some out here on our palette and I'm gonna then add some water very easy now a filter is nothing more than very thin paint on the back of my hand I have some white paint right there okay now first off my brush is very full of paint it's full of water and paint so the first thing I'm gonna do is wick that off onto a paper towel and you can see how much thinner it is now I don't want that excess in there and then I'm gonna kind of run it over something to test how thick it is how much am I moving the color the answer is not much and that's what we want okay we actually don't want a big effect a filter is about a final step that's a very subtle effect it's not about changing everything you've done so far it's about unifying and smoothing what you've done so far so then my final step is going to be to just simply in a very controlled fashion run a layer of this over the whole thing now this gw shade also has the nice effect of getting rid of any gloss i might have because it is a very it dries hyper hyper matte it also tends to stain a little which in most cases is a detriment but in the case of wood is actually a very nice advantage because we want wood to have a little stain a little roughness to it right that's what makes it look natural so what we get when we're all said and done is what i think looks like a pretty nice little piece of wood obviously you can play with making the lines more uh you know more varied or change around with them but i think we turned what is basically a nice white piece of plastic card with absolutely no grain or variance in the texture and it's something that now has some visual interest and looks much more organic. So there you go. That's it. That's how you do faux wood texture. Uh, very simple effect. It's really just the application of sort of repeated techniques. Remember, the key is you're undershading. You want to start from a nice neutral gray. The colder your starting gray or something, by the way, if you have zenithal on it, that's usually perfect as a base to work from. You don't generally need to do anything else. A zenithal will be the perfect mix. Um, but if you have something else, you want just a nice gray. If it's a very cold gray, you're going to tend to, to, to make the wood look green and cold. If it's a very warm gray, the wood is going to appear orange and warm. That's generally how these colors interact. But we start with some undershading by creating lines and striations in our wood, very thin lines of white and black or some sort of very dark gray. And we want those to have a directionality to them. So the white will always be on one side the black always on the other, roughly. Again, we're not tracing, we're not making battle damage. It's just about having something that the subconscious is going to recognize is interacting with light in a realistic way. We can do some stippling, some dots to create little points of interest. We can work in green tones, either through things like uh, a shade color or an actual paint, depending on how pronounced you want it to be. Our, in, our Ink Intensity Intense Wood is uh, really one of the best tools for this. If you don't have this, you can use something like Seraphim Sepia, but you'll have to apply many layers. Like You'll need about four or five layers of this to accomplish what I can do with this in one, just so we're clear. Uh, and then we just repeat the process. Add some new striations, cover it again. Add some dots, cover it again. And what we're building there is then a variance. And you can see how there's lots of different organic variation in that wood, different areas of light and darkness. And this was just two quick applications. If I was doing something I wanted to look really, really nice, if I wanted this to look really, really realistic wood, I would probably spend much more time doing little hacks, little cuts, little tiny details. And I would just repeat this process exactly as I've shown you four or five times to create a lot of depth into the wood. Okay, so there you go. That's it. Faux wood. Nice and easy. Give it a like if you liked it. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. Share this with somebody if you think that they're, maybe if they're doing like a Sylvaneth army or they're working on something with a lot of trees and they, you feel like this would be helpful. Sharing is always the nicest thing you can do and deeply appreciated. But as always, I thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.